I'd like you all to take a moment and close your eyes. I want you to imagine someone that's a doctor, a scientist, plumber, firefighter, astronaut, accountant. What do they look like in your mind's eye? I'm assuming most of you came up something like this. You have a doctor with, you know, stethoscope. I know you're looking at the plumber. Okay. Proverbial plumber's clack. A scientist, safety glasses, lab coat. A firefighter, astronaut, and an accountant. But how many of you have actually ever seen an astronaut? Then why is it that every one of us in this room right now had the same imagery of what an astronaut looks like? That is the power of the media. Television, movies, we create an image of a profession in our mind based upon what we see through social media aspects. And the same thing happens with scientists. It wasn't too long ago a scientist was looked at like this. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, they were revered. But something's changed. And this can actually be stemmed as to a single individual, an individual with orange skin and crazy hair. You all know who I'm talking about. Beaker. <laughs> this 1970s Muppet has dramatically altered a perception of a profession and a whole field, the field of science. When you, see, when you think of Beaker, what do you think? Socially awkward, blows himself up, meep, meep. That is how we perceive science as a whole. And it didn't end with Beaker and the Beaker effect. No, no, it carries on today. What was the biggest show on TV, TV until recently? The Big Bang Theory. Sheldon Cooper, socially awkward. Yes, he did win the Nobel Prize, got married, has friends. But if you were a prepudescent child, would it be someone you want to aspire to become? That is the power that this false narrative of what a professor, what a scientist looks like. I'm a scientist, but am I standing up here wearing a lab coat and safety glasses? And so this is what we have to imagine. This is why there's a growing fear of science as a whole. And so I want to take you on a little journey, two completely unrelated stories of how a fear of science has dramatically altered how we look at things. How many of you have seen something like this? Evil aspartame found in, in gums, yogurts, um, diet beverages. This one chemical that the FDA approved in the early 80s is known to cause arthritis, um, heart disease, cancer, uh, memory loss, mood alterations, you name it, it's all because of this one chemical. So the question is, is it true? Could all these things about this one chemical be true? To answer it, you actually have to understand the chemistry. And so I'm not going to say, like as mentioned before, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. No, I'm actually going to show you. So actually, let's look at the chemical aspartame. It's a rather simple-looking molecule. See what I just did? Simple-looking molecule. And for some of you, that probably made a, oh, that has got to be safe then. Hydrogen cyanide is one of the simplest looking molecules out there, and it's definitely not safe. Simple and, and, uh, simple and safe are not synonymous. But what do we know about aspartame? We know that aspartame gets metabolized in our body in a nice, well-known fashion. It falls apart. And when it is metabolized in our body, it forms three chemicals, aspartic acid, phenylalanine, and methanol. Aspartic acid is one of the 20 essential amino acids. Essential meaning it is found in every single protein in our body. Without it, we cannot function. Phenylalanine is another example of one of those 20 essential amino acids. In fact, interesting, phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine in our body, which is another one of those 20 essential amino acids. Tyrosine is converted to dopamine. Lack of dopamine is associated with Parkinson's disease. Dopamine is further converted to norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are the natural adrenaline molecules of our body. We use it for respiration and cardiac function. All this comes from phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is not the bad metabolite associated with aspartame. However, if you look closely in the back of a pop can or something like that, you'll notice the word phenylketonuria. Just like there are individuals that are allergic to peanuts, there are those individuals that are sensitive to phenylalanine. But you can put a label on a can, but you can't put a label on a steak. So people that have phenylketonuria are advised to avoid certain foods and beverages. So it's not aspartic acid, it's not phenylalanine, so people have now focused on methanol. And so yes, methanol is also known as wood alcohol. And wood alcohol does cause problems. It does cause headaches, fatigue, nausea. 
But the question is, how much methanol is found in a diet beverage? You would need to drink two and a half cans of Diet Coke to get the exact same equivalents found in one glass of apple juice. That's how much methanol there is in there. So actually, we talk about apples all the time. Remember, an apple day keeps a doctor away. Well, let's look at the apple. We, it's, been, it's been around for millions of years. We know everything that's in an apple. There are the ingredients. Have fun with it. <laughs> you have aspartic acid, you have phenylalanine, and you have methanol. So what is going on here? The FDA has conducted studies since this molecule has been on the market for over 40 years, or coming up to 40 years. What is the daily accepted intake of aspartame? Turns out you could drink 20 cans of diet beverages, or 97 packets of sweet and low, or in this case, not sweet and low equal, to get what's level considered the accepted daily intake. This is not the toxic, this is not the lethal level, this is the accepted intake. So what's the hysteria all about? Why is there this fear of a chemical? Why is this fear of the science? And it all comes down to something very similar to the placebo effect. Many of you have heard of the placebo effect. You know, the, the, the power of the mind, mind over matter. Well, for a drug to get onto the market, you actually have to do what's called a placebo study. So I'm actually going to show you a real study. I did not participate in this study, but you'll understand why. Rogaine. In order for Rogaine to get onto the market, they actually have to prove it works. So they had to recruit approximately 700 patients, and these 700 patients over a four-month period had to put a 2% solution on their scalp, and afterwards they had to report the results. 40% of the individuals in this study had no hair growth. 32 had minimal hair growth, 25 had moderate, and 0.7% had dense hair growth. Fantastic results. But at the same time, they must conduct a placebo study with individuals of roughly the same population size. So they recruited approximately 700 patients. 60% had no hair growth, as you would expect. However, 30% had minimal, 10% had moderate, and 0.4% of individuals who were rubbing nothing on their scalp except an ointment for four months had dense hair growth. That is the placebo effect. That is the power of the mind, mind over matter. And the same thing is happening with aspartame only in reverse. An MIT study conducted showed that the symptoms associated with aspartame were same in the control group. But instead of calling this the placebo effect, this is known as the nocebo effect. So where did this all come from? What's going on here? Why is this hysteria of a simple molecule propagating for so long? And the answer, sadly, is money. What happened was NutraSweet which developed aspartame, was developing a monopoly. They were buying up all the other competitors out there that were trying to develop their own artificial sweetener. So these little competitors, to survive, they started a smear campaign to try disparaging aspartame, in this case, NutraSweet. And because back then it didn't work, because there was no social media like we have today, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have Facebook, I don't think MySpace was around back then, it slowly propagated, so even today we see it. So now this is a minor inconvenience. NutraSweet has not made as much money as they could have. Whoop-de-doo. But this fear of science is causing dire consequences today. How many of you have seen a poster or billboard like this? If an apple contains aluminum, mercury, formaldehyde, polysorbidate, MSG, and animal fetal cells, would you eat it? They're in a vaccine. Well, you know that I know the ingredients of an apple. Well, yes, there is aluminum, there is mercury, there is glutamic acid, which is converted naturally to MSG as soon as it hits my stomach. It also contains methanol, which is converted to formic acid, and in the process, forms formaldehyde. Yeah, I'll eat that apple, and I'll take that vaccine, please. And how many of you have ever seen an expression, if you can't pronounce it, don't eat it? (laughs) Any volunteers? So what's going on? Where is this hysteria coming from? Why is there this anti-vaxxer movement? It actually can stem to a single individual, Andrew Wakefield. He conducted an unsanctioned study that looked for a correlation between vaccines and autism. And that study has been attempted to be reproduced time and time again. Millions of your taxpayers' dollars have gone to trying to reproduce that study. And guess what? There isn't a correlation. Zero, zip, nada. And you don't have to trust me, because I don't like saying that. Just use anecdotal evidence if you have to. 
if you don't want to look at the research, look at the Amish community. They do not vaccinate their children. They have the exact same proportion of children that are autistic as those that vaccinate their kids. But what do we know about vaccines? Well, approximately 130,000 preventable illnesses from 2007 to 2014, which corresponds to over 1,300 preventable deaths, and zero, nada, nothing cases of autism is linked to vaccines. Let's just look at a single example, one particular disease, measles. Prior to the introduction of the vaccine for measles, there was over half a million annual cases in the United States of people with measles. That went down to 61. Half a million people down to 61 a year. That's it. That's the power of the vaccine. But what happened? The anti-vaccine movement came along. And now, for the, in the first three months of 2009, 2019 alone, just the first quarter, over 200 cases of measles for a disease that was almost gone. So why is this here? What is going on? How are these anti-vaxxers so successful? And this is the link between the two, the aspartame and the vaccines. Now, instead of slowly developing, we now have celebrities. And boy, do they have a blowhorn. And they're pushing this false narrative, these incorrect facts in their minds. These are not true. Facts are facts. There's no alternative facts. We should be listening to not these celebrities. So I got a question for any of you in this room. If your house was on fire right now, would you call a celebrity or would you call a firefighter? If your basement was flooding, celebrity or plumber? Filing your taxes, celebrity or accountant? If you have a science question, celebrity or scientist? These are the individuals you should be asking, the experts in the scientific field, the Bill, Bill Nye, the Neil deGrasse Tyson, Stephen Hawking's rest of soul, Peter Holtz. These are the experts in their profession. I would not ask them on how to act, how to be a movie star, how to sing, but I would ask them science questions, and so should the general population, to ask the experts in the field. And how many of you have actually even heard of Peter Holtz? He's an MD in the southern United States who's sick and tired not just of the celebrities, but of the doctors. He wants them to get off their laurels and start speaking up and taking the blowhorn away from the celebrity and providing the true narrative out there, because only then will solutions be had. So the question I have for you, is this it? I told you a story of aspartame, which is a minor inconvenience, and now we have people dying for a fear of a science, fear of a profession. What's going on? Is this truly the end of times? Are we at the end? Have we reached a point where this is going to be the last generation? And the answer for me is partly yes, partly no. My generation, Generation X and Generation Y, the heart of this beaker effect is doomed. There are so many people in my generation that have this general fear of science. But the next generation, Generation Z, is where I believe a solution lies. The current generation has something that we did not. When I grew up, I could watch Bill Nye the Science Guy on Tuesday afternoon. And maybe on a Saturday morning cartoon, I could watch one episode that showcased the, and highlighted science. But now, with streaming technology, there are so many possibilities. Sid the Science Kid. Super Wide, Dinosaur Trails, Blue's Clues, Tumbling, Little Einstein. These are shows that showcase the innovation, the curiosity. They promote the stems. And so showing that this bias against a profession is not true. And it's these kids that I had a hope for because the problem is partly due to media, but so is the solution. And it is our next generation that I hope in my heart of hearts will ultimately put an end to the beaker effect. Thank you very much.